Fox 5 and Hot 97 present Street Soldiers with Lisa Evers. I'm so glad you're joining us for this episode of Street Soldiers on the new gang culture. I'm your host, Lisa Evers. As police battle crime, they're worried about the growing youth violence, especially underage gang members with guns. The gangs are different today, and so are the tactics. But the real concern is how to prevent these teens from heading down the wrong road in the first place. A significant number of our shooting incidents involving our people who are young center on gangs and street crews. We got an exclusive inside look at how the NYPD is focusing on the most violent offenders and not doing the wide net sweeps of the past that sometimes snared innocent neighbors. In Queens, it was two rival gangs, more than 30 alleged members, most between 18 and 22 years old, and some juveniles, all police say with previous criminal justice involvement, and now charged with gang conspiracy in two murders and multiple shootings using dozens of guns. This pretty much shoot on sight when they see the opposition. Um, and a lot of times, innocent people are caught in, in the middle of it. So it's just young kids just kind of doing whatever they want. And it's any idea they come up with, they get other people on board and they just go do random, crazy things. Experts say easy access to cheap guns has escalated the violence. In the 90s, there were rules. Uh, you had to ask permission before you killed somebody. And now the body counts never enough. My cameraman and I had to put on bulletproof vests due to the potential for danger. The roots of the problem run deep, says A.T. Mitchell, founder of the Man Up organization. Our neighborhoods and our societies spelled our young people and left them out to do whatever they want to do and commit these vicious crimes. Police say the gang rivalry heats up to a boiling point on live social media taunts and in drill music videos where they allegedly bragged about the location of the shootings and calibers of guns in actual incidents. The drill rap is always a motivator, right? And the drill rap is so specific in that they mention people uh, that have been killed in the past and disrespect those people that have been killed in the past. And it creates a residual effect. These guys did horrific violence out in uh, the streets of South Jamaica. So it's a victory for the community today that these guys are actually all apprehended. We brought together a special panel. Let's find out what they have to say. Joining me right now is Ralph Salento. He's a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and he's also a former lieutenant commander with NYPD Detectives. Ralph, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Lisa. We appreciate it. And also with us is A.T. Mitchell. He is the founder of the Man Up organization. They've been doing a lot of great work on the streets of the city for many years. He's also the New York City gun czar. A.T., thank you so much for being with us. It is a pleasure, Lisa, to see you again. Thank you for having me. We, we appreciate it. And also joining us is Dante Mills. He's an attorney. He is a partner with Mills and Edwards and also a law professor at Temple University. Dante, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lisa. Thank you. Ralph, I want to start with you on this. Is this our imagination, or is there really a big difference between what we're seeing with these gang arrests today compared to back in the day? No, no, there's a big difference. Uh, there's a big difference in the way that the gangs operate. There's a big difference in the way that they recruit. There is uh, an ethnicity uh, difference. Uh, and there's a, also a difference in the way that we surveil them, investigate them, and ultimately prosecute them. In terms of these gangs, AT, you're, you're, your people are out on the streets, you're out in the community, you're seeing this happen. One of the things that people have been very shocked by is the extreme youth. There, A lot of these cases, there's, they're as young as 13 and 14. The ones that are 18, you know, the uh, law enforcement authorities tell us that they had their start in the criminal activity at, an, at a very young age, you know, when they were under the age. What do you make of that? Well, Lisa, they're children, um, right? Those ages that you just quoted, they're, at most they're teenagers, but they're certainly not adults. And so a lot of them are very naive of the full consequences of their actions. And so right now they're playing like what we used to do as kids with toys in their mind, not realizing that these are real weapons. And they're going about uh, a lifestyle that they don't really fully understand. And they don't understand it, obviously, so as it relates to how they are being, like right now, uh, picked up and how they're being corralled into the criminal justice system. So, yeah, I mean, it's a lot younger, you know, children. And, 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 and really, that's what we have to see them as and begin to try to really curve their behavior before they, they lose the rest of their lives. But A.T., you're, so you're saying that they really don't understand that these guns, that they're firing in broad daylight with 
kids around, little children around, people going to work with real bullets that they're not real. That's what you're saying? No, I'm saying they do not understand the full consequences of their actions. Uh, I've also, our organization, we work in a juvenile detention centers where these young people are brought to when they are apprehended. And at the end of the day, these kids are really clueless. They don't know the law. They don't know actually, the, like again, the, the behavior that they have chosen, a lifestyle that they've chosen. Um, yet they are, by the eyes of the society, yes, they are using real weaponry. They're causing up real havoc on communities. And again, you know, at the end of the day, it's too late. Once the kid has his hand or access to a gun, it's almost too late. Um, Dante, when you look, when you look at this from a, a a defense attorney standpoint, and also from the way these prosecutions are going, at least in New York City, I don't know if this trend is is evolved in other places as well. But like six, seven years ago, when they were doing gang sweeps, they pick up 150 people. These massive numbers, large arrests, and it could be somebody who grew up with, you know, whose best friend that they grew up with as kids was a gang member, but he wasn't a gang member. They were included in the sweep, and now it's, it seems to be much much more focused. What what experience have you had with this, and what do you see happening? Well, I do handle these types of cases all over the country. I think the experiences are pretty much the same. You do have now more focused investigations because the investigation techniques are a little bit better. Um, I think that they have a, an easier opportunity to get into the minds of the people involved with this. Social media helps with that. They can do some investigation and realize who's actually a part of it, who's just kind of hanging around and not committing crimes or doing illegal activity. I will say, though, that something that these children need to understand, and they are children, right? And they're in this position because generally they have no hope elsewhere. They don't have people taking care of them. They don't have means and opportunity. And there's guys who saying, listen, come hang with me for today. I'll give you some money. I'll feed you. And then one thing leads to another. But they are children who are led astray. Uh, but the one thing they need to understand is if an investigation comes down, if they furthered the crime at all, they can be charged with everything that's involved with it. You don't have to pull the trigger to be the one charged with murder. All you have to do is further that crime in any way. And a lot of these children don't understand. They can say, oh, I'm just, I'm not really involved. I'm only doing a little bit, but that exposes you to everything. And that's a problem. We'll be back right after this. I have to say something provocative. You guys be, feel free to respond. Ralph, in terms of the, in terms of the investigations, there was a time when, you know, there's a, there's a street phrase, you know, snitches, uh, snitches get stitches because snitches were the lowest of the low on the street culture uh, totem pole. But now one of the things that's been so shocking, the first time I saw it at one of these uh, press conferences that I, I had to cover was there, they were making videos using the actual gun that was you that prosecutors say was used in the actual crime, right. shouting out the street corner, shouting out the name of the person that they allegedly shot with, with that type of, you know, with that type of specificity. In terms of the investigations, what does that do for investigators? Well, of course, uh, technology really helps out investigations. And don't forget that we're talking about the dynamics of gangs that change. As far as like the metrics across the country go, the metrics are pretty much the same. There's like 28 to 32,000 gangs across the country. Uh, they estimate about 800,000 members are in those gangs. And that number has kind of moved 100,000 or so. Uh, now experts opine that there's over a million people in gangs. Uh, that's exacerbated by uh, illegal immigration where you have Central and South American people coming in. And then they join gangs. You see that a lot in Long Island. So, like, it's the dynamics of the gangs that change, not the pure numbers. Because the numbers go up and down, like, within uh, sort of a, a top and bottom range. But the way that you investigate them are different now, the gang culture, because, uh, as Dante was saying, it's much more focused. You don't see these tremendous sweeps. Uh, what you see is really, really targeted, uh, you know, targeted investigations. And... You hear the NYPD talk about this when they talk about precision policing. I mean, that's a real thing. And so social media allows them to identify gang members. And you are absolutely right, Lisa. They are scoping out street corners. They're putting it in these uh, drill videos. Uh, of course, the, the the nature of the drill video is ultra violence. I mean, I'm sure that your other panelists know that the drill video started in Chicago, in Chicago uh, and that was the ultra violent lyrics 
And so it's about bragging about what you've done. And that makes it easier for investigators to, um, you know, uh, assign a culpability, if you will, to each of the gang members and make sure that they're they're targeting the right people. So I just want to get a little more background on this. So, A.T., when we talk about, I mean, portraying 14 and 15 year olds as ultra violent criminals, I, I have even though, you know, whatever they've committed, I have a problem with that because of their age. And also, I've interviewed a number of, of drill artists that have been, also have been involved in criminal activity that have records, and that as they got older, they tried to get out of crime and, and really have a legitimate music career. But a lot of their personal stories, 14 years old, their older brother shot and killed, That's no true. kind of counseling. Every time they go home, they have to worry about uh, sur surviving, and the only way for them to survive others you know, one parent see the other parent's substance abuse. They end up on the streets at 15 or 16, and we don't really have a place for these boys to go. That's right, Lisa. So you, you're spot on. So when you think about it from that lens or see things through that lens, you get a different picture, right? A lot of these young people are growing up in violent neighborhoods and under, you know, uh, service neighborhoods, communities where there are disparities that are, that are ridiculous and their opportunities to make it out is even less. Hip hop has always been that tool of ours that was created to depict the shed light on some of the uh, the light on some of the ills of our societies. And these young people, um, being artistic as they are, are just trying to follow in that same trend of hip hop, right? Just like by the same token, do it for the by the same token, the violence, the trauma for the no community question. members is, is really real. Dante, what about the videos? The, you know, the music videos as evidence because there's been a lot of cases about this and controversies and, and new laws about it. What what are your What's your take on that? Yeah, I will say that these videos are coming out, but the times have changed. Social media has infiltrated every part of life. That's between a teacher, a, a gang member, no matter who it is, oh, yeah, they've sure. turned, people have turned to social media. So before where you would have gang members on the streets bragging about what they did, now they just have a bigger platform. Right. So the, the issue is, can that be used in court? I've had everything from a client in New York who had pictures on his phone of uh, bricks of, of, of drugs being delivered and cooked and everything else. And of course, when the FBI or, or the investigators come in, they grab the videos off the phone and they say, we have our proof right here. And there's ways that you can combat it. But these these people are setting themselves up. Uh, they're putting themselves in situations where they're essentially telling on themselves. Dante, I want to start with you on this one. The laws, when the age was raised to 17 in New York, there are some people who are supporters of the law who say this was necessary because we don't want to stigmatize youth who could get off on the wrong foot for the rest of their lives and just fill up that prison, you know, that, that prison pipeline. Other opponents say that this has given older criminals a way to get younger, these younger and younger teens to do their dirty work because they just go to family court if they even get that far and get a slap on the wrist. What's your, so basically it's, it's introducing them to criminal life at a younger and younger age. What's your take on that? There's a balance. I truly agree that you do not want to put uh, someone who was a teen and got caught up in something, you don't want to put them in the box for the rest of their lives. And I have many friends that I grew up with that caught a felony or something at 18, 19 years old they're in their 40s now and still can't get jobs, still can't go to school, still they're impacted by those early mistakes. And I do think you have to protect against that. But we also have to understand that there are situations, and I've dealt with this with many clients, where there's a 15-year-old, 16-year-old who's being told, listen, you take the fall for this because you get a hard reset in a couple of years. You won't have to do real time. Um, they're being incentivized to do that. So... We have to find that balance. I do think that we want to we want to err on protecting our children. So I would err on that no matter what and just hope that they're not being taken advantage of by people who are older and are putting them in a position to take a fall for them. But we can't. We can't lock those people up for the rest of their lives and say, you made a mistake at 15 and you're done. Um, so we want to err on protecting our children. I think that's the right side to go. Ralph, what about that? Yeah, well, that I agree with Dante. That is definitely happening. They are recruiting younger people where, again, you guys will know in your historical knowledge that it used to be the older gang members would have the young kids sit it out 
where they have to mature, uh, they, they had them sit out certain criminal activities. That is not happening now. They know that there is limited culpability under the law with bail reform and everything else. These kids are going in and out. And uh, it, it's it's it, it's really sickening to see, uh, to APs for like these kids really don't even understand the full depth of what they're getting involved in. The past two summers, we've seen very, very young teens. It was young, two young teenagers charged in the murder of an 11-year-old girl in the Bronx last year. Very, very sad. Yeah, that was that's when the 15-year-old and the 18-year-old was in pursuit of a 13-year-old. Right. Who unfortunately, missed the 13-year-old and shot the 11-year-old. Um, and and we know the rest of that. That was that was an ugly situation. Um, the youth, the ages of these kids that are entering into this uh, lifestyle. Is, is as we said, much younger. And again, because of the age factor and, and lack of knowledge of not just the law, but of even criminality, right? There was a generation that like was said that would coach us and, and let, uh, like, look, like, you're not ready for this. This is not your turn. This is right. not your time. Matt, right? This is, this is not your life. We don't want this for you, right? But right, yep. today, unfortunately, that type of mentorship, and it, call it what it is, it doesn't exist. Now, I have to say something provocative. You guys can be, feel free to respond, but let me get it out first. I am all for gun violence reduction programs. We're getting federal grants, putting money back into the community. But here's what I'm going to tell you. As long as there is accountability, there are millions of dollars at stake here going flushing out into the communities, and nobody is on the hook for it. There's no accountability. There's no metrics. Now, even the two things that you just said, are largely anecdotal unless we could back it up with facts. Wait, this is wait, wait, Chuck, hold on, what about finish. it? Hey, wait, no, I finish. AC knows about a condo. What about this? Let me finish. I'm sure that there's some great stuff going on in the community. I'm not downing the work that you do or your dedication to that work. What I'm saying is that the NYPD has intelligence that a lot of these violence reduction programs, uh, these ex-cons or ex-gang members that are going out into gangs to work with the gangs, oftentimes are being reassimilated back into the gang and are not sharing gang intelligence with the police. Okay, well, so I'd, like to be to part of the I'd like to look into that uh, 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 as a reporter, but AT, what about that? Because you have, well, they have to be accountable for what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Accountability is, is our, our number one, you know, position. But as the professor should know and should be aware, there are tons of evaluations that is actually published, that is out there, that speaks to the evidence that these sort of programs do work and work effectively. The very university for which you are a part of, sir, conducted one back in 2017 on the work that was being done here in New York City that showed the remarkable reduction in gun violence in those neighborhoods. And our organization, Man Up Incorporated, and our other partners, CMS sites, were mentioned in that. Um, and, and just so that you know, it also released a, a, realized another organic point that interestingly enough, when gun violence is going down, relationships between police and communities actually improved upon. And so I want you to know, sir, that when you speak and say with these ex-cons and, 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 and these ex-offenders, that's exactly the point. They are not ex-anything. They are returning citizens. They are formerly incarcerated people. And we had a, I'm with, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just saying right there. I appreciate it from that. I want to take this just that first. understand that it's, it's, it begins with that. When you're looking at people who have been there and done that, you are looking at people who have lived experiences at, on a screen. You're looking at one. And I, I, I'm going to take this a step further. Evidence talk about, I'm going to take this a step further and talk about a lived experience. I wrote a piece that was published talk, and, and the title was, what if the wreck was closed that day? When I was growing up, there was a recreation center in my neighborhood that the roof had a leak and it would rain um, and the, the rain would come in and the wreck would have to be closed. I remember specifically, and I mentioned this in that piece, where I was hanging out with friends. They wanted to go do something. I said, you know what? I'm going to go play basketball in the wreck because the wreck had a program for us there. They went out and did something illegal and they all got arrested and their lives were completely different from mine. Mine could have been the same way. But yep. that program was available. So there's no guarantee that every program is, go is going to be top notch, that everybody will do what they're supposed to do as far as accountability. But I will risk that every single time to make these programs available to our kids and give them an alternative. Because if it changes one life, 
Yeah. That, that, that makes it all worth it. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Street Soldiers on the new gang culture. You can share it and watch it again on our Fox 5 NY YouTube page. Remember, use your mind. It's your best weapon.